We are continuing to follow breaking news. The United States Geological Survey says that the Northeast has been hit by a 4.8 magnitude earthquake. They report the epicenter is White House Station in central New Jersey. But shaking could be felt in parts of New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and Connecticut. Dr. Judith Hubbard has spent 30 years studying earthquakes around the world, is currently a visiting scientist at Cornell University, and joins us now. Uh, thanks so much, Judith, for being with us. Um, first of all, as, as we sort of get our heads around what took place for many of us here in the Northeast, it's the first time we've experienced something like this in this part of the world. Can you first of all talk about the rarity of a quake like this on the East Coast? Sure. Um, and so so most of the time when we hear about earthquakes, we hear about them happening along plate boundaries, which in the United States includes California, uh, Oregon, Washington, and Alaska. But here on the East Coast, people often don't re realize that there are earthquakes here as well. Those earthquakes are usually quite a lot smaller and quite a lot more rare, and they don't happen on plate boundary faults. They typically happen on very old faults that are reactivating due to large scale tectonic stresses. Um, the earthquake that just hit New Jersey is one of the largest that's ever hit the New York City area. Um, so Judith, I'm wondering, you said that large scale tectonic stresses, um, to use your phrase, that is something that could potentially contribute to an earthquake. We don't know exactly, obviously, at this stage, um, what surrounded this event. But I wonder, what are those kinds of large-scale tectonic stresses? What does that actually mean? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so most of the time, we think about you know, one plate is moving past another plate. And that makes a lot of sense, because mm -hmm. you have to have fractures between the two plates. Here we are in the middle of a plate. But even when you're in the middle, when plates are moving past each other on the edges, that can cause stresses to transmit into the interiors of the plates. So the, the stresses don't just stay on the edges. The whole plate is getting squished and bumped and squeezed, and that can cause stresses on these old fractures that exist inside the plate. And actually, the location where the earthquake happened is on a fault that we know about. It's a really super old fault that probably formed about 200 million years ago when North America first split off of Africa. Um, but it's still a fault. It's still a fracture in the earth. And so when you have these stresses being transmitted into the interior, they're often going to cause slip on places where the crust is weaker. So places where the crust is already broken in the past. Given that it is a rarity for these kinds of events to occur, um, here, I'm thinking particularly on the island of Manhattan, where you have many structures that are quite tall. One has to wonder about aging infrastructure, uh, aging foundations, and whether or not the actual land itself, upon which many of these skyscrapers sit, is sturdy enough to withstand this kind of magnitude uh, of an earthquake and to have those buildings be relatively undamaged. I don't know if that's a question you can answer, um, but I'm curious, uh, about the difference in maybe geologically the land that Manhattan is comprised of versus, say, out on the West Coast in California, where they are more um, experienced with these kinds of events? It's a great question. Um, there's a, a few different parts to that. Um, <clears throat> first, we actually tend to get um, larger areas that experience shaking when earthquakes happen here on the East Coast. And that's because Typically, the rocks that we live on are older and colder and harder, and so they can transmit that seismic energy more efficiently from one place to another. Um, that efficient transmission means more people might feel the earthquake, but it actually can reduce the intensity of shaking at a given location because uh, when, those, when the shaking slows down, it causes extra strong shaking in one place. It amplifies the shaking, but if the shaking can be transmitted through the crust, then it doesn't amplify in the same way. But there are issues where when people live on what's called um, made land, places where people expanded uh, like the city limits by putting soil into the ocean, uh, those areas are especially vulnerable to earthquake shaking. So I don't know exactly in Manhattan how much of the land is sort of original hard rock and how much of it is places where people expanded the boundaries of the city um, into the ocean 
those areas can be more dangerous. Interesting. And so as someone who has studied earthquakes, what are the questions that you have surrounding this specific event, given just how unusual it is for them to take place here? So one of the, the first questions I asked myself when I, I heard about the earthquake, and I heard about the earthquake from my, my siblings who all live in the New, York, New Jersey, New York area, they, they said, Judith, what happened? Was that an earthquake? Um, is what is the history of earthquakes in this region? Earthquake histories don't tell us enough about faults to know how big the earthquakes can get, but they're a clue. Um, and in the New Jersey, New York area, we have records of earthquakes that go back into the 1700s, maybe the 1600s. So there are some records of earthquakes of this magnitude, maybe a little larger, like in 1884, there was an earthquake in the New York City area. Um, and those tell us that earthquakes have in the past reached high magnitude four, low magnitude five, in some cases up to about magnitude six. Uh, for instance, the Cape Ann earthquake um, offshore of Massachusetts, but there aren't very many of them. So this is really unusual. Uh, Judith, I'm so sorry, you dropped out for just a moment, but um, for our viewers that may just be joining us now, it is just before noon here on the East Coast, uh, and we are continuing to follow breaking news here. Again, the United States Geological Survey says that the Northeast has been hit by a 4.8 magnitude earthquake, and we are fortunate to be joined uh, by Judith Hubbard, who has spent 30 years combined uh, studying earthquakes around the world, currently is a visiting scientist at Cornell University. And Judith, we are, um, as, as we are watching this shot of Manhattan here, we should let our viewers know we are also currently keeping an eye uh, on a picture of where we expect New York City Mayor Eric Adams to speak at any moment. So when that happens, we'll, of course, bring that to you. But just a short time ago, Judith, we heard from Governor Kathy Hochul of New York State describing the initial assessments as they continue to try and survey whatever type of damage or injuries may have resulted uh, because of this earthquake. And as of now, we have not received uh, word of anything particularly extensive. Uh, but if you could give us a sense, Judith, of the context, when we talk about 4.8 magnitude, can you give us a sense of perspective? How large is that in comparison to other major quakes in recent history? Sure. A magnitude 4.8 is not that large. It's large enough to cause um, moderate shaking near the epicenter low levels of shaking further away. Some of the shaking reports for this earthquake come from a thousand kilometers away, that's maybe 600 miles, so that's that's really far. But the shaking intensities were, were relatively low. Um, in comparison, there was just an earthquake in Taiwan, a magnitude 7.4. A 7.4 releases about 8,000 times as much energy as a magnitude 4.8. Um, so, so it's a, clearly a much larger event than, than the recent magnitude 4.8. One thing that people will probably be, um, need to watch for now is aftershocks of this earthquake. The magnitude of aftershocks depends on uh, sort of the, the magnitude of the original earthquake, but the USGS does put out a forecast for aftershocks, and it's saying that most likely aftershocks will stay below magnitude four, but there is a chance of, earth, of aftershocks above magnitude four. Over the next year, a chance, an 8% chance of aftershocks above magnitude five, which is actually bigger than the original event, and even a 1% chance of a magnitude six in the next year. Uh, so the earthquake causes a stress change in the crust, and that can cause other earthquakes to occur on nearby faults. Really interesting to hear that because we also heard Governor Hochul, in fact, warn folks that aftershocks were a possibility and that if they were felt, that they should essentially brace themselves and protect themselves uh, in the event that there were aftershocks. Uh, if you could, uh, Judith, explain for viewers as well, um, you know, what is happening during an aftershock? If one were to occur, you know, people may wonder, is this the buildup? Is this something that uh, signals potentially something more intense to come? Or what, what, geologically speaking, is an aftershock? So we use different words. We use words like force shock, main shock, aftershock. All of these shocks are just earthquakes. There is no physical difference between a main shock and an aftershock. It's just another earthquake. 
But we call them aftershocks because we know that after a large earthquake or even a moderate earthquake, that it causes this change in the stresses on the faults. And so we typically see more earthquakes after the first one. Um, sometimes, in, in unusual cases, you'll have an earthquake that causes a stress change on another fault, and then that fault has a bigger earthquake. And then we rename the first earthquake a foreshock because it happened before the biggest earthquake. So there is a chance that this could be a foreshock, but nobody has been able to come up with a way to distinguish whether a small earthquake is a foreshock or not. So that's not something anybody can predict. Um, we just know that there is an elevated risk of earthquakes now because the first earthquake happened. Um, and so people should be alert to the possibility. They should learn what to do in an earthquake. Um, they should look around their home and see are there things that are earthquake hazards, things that could fall down? Uh, are there are there hot water heaters, you know, stable? All those things are, are basic good practices for, for being ready in case there is an earthquake. Some very good advice. Dr. Judith Hubbard, thank you so much for sharing your insight and expertise with us. We really appreciate it, uh, especially at this time. Thank you. Let's turn back to Dr. Robert Weiss. Uh, for some analysis, uh, you'll recall I had to cut you off, Professor, um, earlier. Apologies for that. But uh, he is a professor of natural hazards in Virginia Tech's Department of Geosciences. And, uh, Professor, I wonder if you could just go back to the notion of uh, how often an event of this magnitude happens in this particular part of the country. How rare is this? Extremely rare. It would take several decades between events main events to take place of that magnitude. There always is a chance of smaller earth earthquake to uh, take place, uh, and those earthquakes most likely are not going to be felt. The shaking of this earthquake is interesting because it is felt in a larger area, up to the Baltimore and even D.C. area. People felt it, uh, as it appears. But again, the, uh, the design criteria for building and bridges and tunnels and infrastructure in general uh, in a way that it should easily um, uh, withstand um, the accelerations of the ground, the shaking of the ground that are generated, that has, that are generated by the earthquakes uh, shouldn't be a big problem. And as you can see, the uh, the uh, um, operations in, in New York City seem to be back to normal. That was going to be my question, Professor, when it comes to uh, not just the buildings, but just the infrastructure of New York City itself. I'm thinking about, for instance, the subway system, we heard from the city officials a moment ago, essentially saying that their operations have continued uh, uninterrupted, even um, as people you know, start to kind of process what has taken place, but that their operations continue because of the fact that, as you say, these tunnels, these systems have been designed to withstand seismic events of greater magnitude than this. Um, but it does occur to me that these are aging tunnels, their aging systems. Can you talk a bit about the effect of something like this, the wear and tear simply on a system, uh, even though these may have been over-designed in a sense to, to withstand these kinds of magnitude events, um, that it does actually have an impact, does it not, uh, over time? Yeah, so uh, planners are different than uh, like the, the average uh, person on the street. We don't re usually anticipate to uh, encounter an earthquake, right? That's not in our mind, but planners do. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are working with engineers to design those buildings in the context of where they are in, in terms of natural hazards that could hit the infrastructure. In this, in this context of, 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 uh, of, of continuous maintenance, the American Association or Society for Civil Engineer, ASAE, they give scorecards for these kind of uh, infrastructure, aging infrastructure. And I can tell you across the United States, the, 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 the score that ASAE gives for general infrastructure maintenance is not a very high one. But uh, um, events like today remind us that we do need to pay attention to, the, uh, to those deferred maintenance costs and actually make sure that our infrastructure functions as designed. And an, an older bridge may not withstand uh, earthquake, an earthquake that is a little bit larger than uh, what we uh, observe today. Uh, but in general, I would say infrastructure is in good shape, uh, but we do need to pay attention because of every incident like today uh, uh, results in, an, in a decrease of functionality of the infrastructure or could uh, decrease in, uh, uh, result in a decrease of functionality. Small cracks and so forth can really be,
uh, something detrimental to infrastructure as they develop over time. Right. Could you talk about that a bit more, Professor? I'm thinking in particular of areas um, that may be not part of the initial sort of bedrock foundation uh, here in the tri-state area, if there may be uh, some coastal areas, for instance, that have been filled in in order to um, allow for development there. How vulnerable would those kinds of uh, areas be? So, so and it's actually kind of uh, interesting to look at uh, areas that are filled in with, uh, you know, soil and, and are not part of the bedrock. It's actually likely that those areas haven't did not feel at all the uh, the impact of the earthquake, especially in, in greater distances from the impact uh, from the epicenter, because of the way seismic waves travel through the ground. If it is a very solid rock, um, like crystal, what we call crystalline rock, that is solid and uh, was generated as part of a of a, perhaps a, a magma chamber of a of a, of a, volcan of a volcano many million, million years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, seismic waves travel really efficiently through that area and then and then cause significant shaking. But in sedimentary rocks, that's not the case. So the what we call dissipation of energy is much larger and therefore the effect is much lower. So I would I would speculate that in coastal areas where fillings took place, while there may have been shaking, uh, it was much less felt than in other areas that are based on the solid like ground of, of crystalline rock. All right. Well, uh, Professor Robert Weiss, Professor, we thank you very much for taking the time to uh, help us understand this geological event. Thank you so much, Professor. Thanks for having me. Let's turn to John Vidali now joining us. He is a seismologist and the Dean's Professor of Earth Sciences at the University of Southern California. Uh, professor, thanks very much for being with us. So um, to Errol's point, I'm wondering if you can give us any sense of aftershocks and the possibility now, uh, it is 106 here on the East Coast. We're a couple of hours out from when this event happened initially. Um, how unusual, how common would an aftershock be at this point? Well, it's pretty common. I mean, almost every earthquake has aftershocks. It's just that most of them are small. And as he said, there's a good chance of magnitude three aftershock in the next day or so. We usually consider aftershocks last uh, perhaps a week, dying away you know, with time after the big event. There's already been a magnitude two about an hour after the earthquake. Uh, that's all that's been recorded that I've seen. Um, so there's a chance, but you know, it takes a magnitude five really to do much damage. You know, I haven't heard reports of damage from the main shock. Uh, and so there's like a one in 20 chance of something bigger than the main shock. But in fact, a lot of the time when that was, would have been likely, but has already passed. So I think very small chance of anything damage uh, coming up in the next few days and even less after that. And I wonder, Professor, if you could just give us some context and some perspective here. How unusual is it for an event of this magnitude to take place in this part of the country? And, and why might that be? Well, you know, these events are common in the West Coast. We have magnitude fives every year uh, along the coast. Uh, they do happen in the East Coast, but it's more like once every couple of decades. Um, we do know of earthquakes that have happened of this size before near New York City, but it's only been a couple in, in a century. So um, it's not a shock. On the other hand, it is an unusual occurrence. Um, we like to say it's a, it's a reminder that, you know, we need to prepare in a place like New York City that rarely gets earthquakes. Even a little shake can kind of test some systems and it's good that people are inspecting to make sure that nothing was disturbed. Yeah, what would be the questions that you have um, maybe on that front, Professor? Just structurally speaking, you know, these are inspections that are continuing to happen along bridges, in, in tunnels. We heard New York City Mayor Eric Adams talk about at this point there does not appear to be any kind of impacts, um, major impacts to infrastructure, certainly no injuries to speak of. But over the long term, um, what would be the questions or concerns that you might have, given that it was not a 5.0, but a 4.8 was certainly something that uh, got a lot of a lot of people's attention for sure. Yeah, well, it you know would lead people to take a more careful look at the faults in the region. You know, we we have geodetic instruments like your car with GPS, where we can try to tell if the ground is shifting. Um, 
we always could use a more precise map of just where the faults are and how, how fast the tectonic plates are shifting. Um, you know, it's far from the major boundaries in New York, uh, uh, but also people can take a look at, you know, which places that people have built or have amplified shaking. Uh, you know, we soft ground can increase shaking by like a factor of two, and we're always trying to calibrate the engineering to make sure that the buildings are built to the standard that they need, even if the earthquakes only come every hundred years. And is there a way, um, when you talk about aftershocks, is there a way to sort of predict, um, you know, the frequency or, or uh, the, the time frame at all that an aftershock might occur? Uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of the statistics. I mean, mathematically, I could give you a rule, it falls off like one over time, but Basically, you know, after a week, it's uh, fallen off to about a tenth the rate that you'd see after just one day. Um, and but we can't predict any individual event. Uh, earthquake prediction has basically stalled. What we can do in the West Coast, and we've already implemented, is have earthquake early warning, and that's where the sensors first detect an earthquake, estimate how big it is, and broadcast a warning. And you can get five or ten seconds of. Uh, a heads up time to be ready for strong shaking. It's not much, but it actually can help quite a bit. And is there a way to tell whether or not an earthquake, a particular event, uh, might be a precursor to something even larger in magnitude? Or is that not something that science can no, tell us? That's the holy grail. I mean, we've been looking for earthquake prediction for 100 years and analyzed every pattern we can think of and every year people tell us uh, even more exotic ideas of how it might work but uh, no you know the only real indicator of increased danger is when there is a big earthquake we have aftershocks so right after a big earthquake is the worst time in terms of danger but uh, when big events that we see around the world just don't give us a warning and the questions you have after an event like this here what would those, some of those lingering questions be for you as someone who studies these kinds of events? Yeah, from our point of view, the most useful information comes from the seismometers that are in the ground, and they tell us are our models of shaking amplification right. So do we have the stronger buildings where they need to be stronger? Uh, and also, if they, people find flaws in buildings, if this magnitude 5 cracks some things, shifted some things uh, that it shouldn't have, um, we always have to have our eyes open for surprises, so, so that'd be the main thing. We don't expect to, to see much damage, but certainly it's worth looking to make sure we're aware of where the weaknesses are. All right, Professor John Vidali, we thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. It's extremely helpful uh, as we wait to see what the next 24, 48 hours or so brings. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, yeah, thank you.